Hi, I am Jude Schneider with the Science and Technical Communications Practice at Cardinoentrix. Today my colleague Liz Bradford and I are going to talk about how to develop posters. I will talk about content and then throw it to Liz, our science communications designer, to talk about design and layout. The discussion that follows is based on the concepts of technical communication that we use at Cardinoentrix. Our point of view has been honed by cognitive and historical research, our training, and our past experience. There are many ways to develop posters, equally valid, and the suggestions in here are not meant to suggest CTAC requirements. All of the material that follows, including the images, is owned by the authors or by CTAC, unless otherwise noted. If you haven't been to a poster session, they are chaotic, especially during the cocktail hour poster social. And there are 100 posters competing for attention. People are literally cruising by. How do you get them to stop and focus on what has taken you months or years to develop? There's an element of creativity to producing a poster. Rules are not hard and fast as they are in a paper. You get to choose your layout, your sections, your fonts, and colors. If there's an overarching message to this presentation, it is that simple always works better than complicated. We're going to discuss story, structure, text, layout design, graphics and infographics, and you'll see a pattern. Shorter titles, fewer ideas, fewer bullets, fewer words, shorter words, simpler design, less data. Use parallel constructions to simplify patterns. These will all help you hone in on your messages and create a memorable poster. Let's talk about how to develop content. Why are you planning to stand in front of a crowd to share your work? What is exciting about it? What captured the attention of CTAC's judges? Your story questions current thinking, advances science, refines a concept, improves a method. If your subject is methods and demonstrating that your methods provide similar results to experiments done with other methods, then focus on that. Create a poster that ties its title content and visuals to communicating that this poster is about methods, not on the implications of the results. Similarly, if you used standard methodology and got provocative results, reference your methodology, but focus the text and visuals on your results. Give less weight to elements that are not tied directly to your theme. Elements should be required for comprehension, relevant to your discussion and conclusion, not obvious or assumed, i.e. not background science. The qualifier at the bottom is important, though. We are not saying that you should discard data or analysis that confounds or contradicts your conclusions, but you do not need to detail everything. So if you were writing a paper, it might look like this, but the organization of your poster might look more like this. Or this. Your poster is not meant to simply impress conference goers with your grasp of the subject matter. It's meant to inform them about something that they don't already know. Remember, not everyone is an expert on your topic, and some may be completely unfamiliar with it. You need to write and design with smart scientists, but not necessarily specialists in mind. 800 words. This is a wild approximation, of course. More images and less words are even better, and you can probably squeeze in up to 1,000 words before you're seriously over cramming the space. But remember that more words do not make your poster more memorable. We aren't going to focus on all of these, but you get to decide what sections to include, what to call these sections, and what to feature. I will go through these fairly quickly, but note that CTAC discourages you from putting your abstract on the poster. A lot of people do it, but it's redundant and a waste of your limited real estate. We're going to 
going to spend a little time discussing titles. It's the case that it's too late to change the title in the abstract book. However, CTAC approves of you shortening your titles to the poster itself, as long as you retain keywords so that conference goers will be able to find your poster by poster number and abstract. Here are two adjacent posters from CTAC. These are from 2011. Which one would catch your attention as you strolled by? You'll see that there's a lot more information in the first title. But the second title is way more compelling. You might glance at the first title and walk on. But the second poster would be more likely to make you pause. The first poster tells you very literally what it is about and where it takes place. But the second poster title really tells you why it matters. One quick edit for the first title would be to remove the location information. You can pick that up in the text, and that allows your title to take up less lines and be a quicker read for passers-by. We're going to look more closely at another title from the CTAC Abstract Book of 2011 to help sort out how you can simplify titles. This is a fairly complex title, not just because of the number of words, but also because of the cumbersome structure. Uh, we're going to go through a little exercise to demonstrate how it can be shortened. And although we're only looking at a title, the same lesson can be applied to shortening all of your text. There are a lot of 23-word or longer sentences that could be helped by a critical look at whether all the words are strictly necessary. I will caution you, though, this exercise is based on our reading of the title alone. So while this is a theoretical exercise, the authors of the poster are not here to defend their choices, which could be absolutely valid. And second, accuracy is crucial. Do not sacrifice accuracy for the sake of brevity. This title includes just one layering of what I would call using phrases when words will do, a subject we'll come back to later as well. So let's get rid of some of the redundant phrases recent experiences in the, required by the, for the registration of. And we took out conventional pesticide products as a specific detail that might not be required in the title. It seems like a distinction that is moot unless there is room for confusion. And here's a far simpler title. One more detail. In the abstract, even the authors talk about songbirds. So why not use the common term in the title so that it's a quicker read and more likely to catch someone's eye? A couple other notes on titles. Do not define acronyms in titles. And as I mentioned earlier, unless location is specifically a relevant part of your story, you can reference locations by site name rather than county or state. Uh, use species name or common name, but not both. And remember that anything in your title, like an acronym or species name, will be further explained in your text. Introductions. In the introduction, start with a problem that you're setting out to solve. Why does it matter? And, having defined the problem, what, in a nutshell, are you doing to solve it? A cliché among journalists is, don't bury the lead. Define your story and tell us why it's important. Start with a couple of clear, simple sentences letting us know what this is about. E even if your subject matter is complex and highly technical, try to explain the problem in your approach in clear, simple language so that everyone at CTEC understands what you're trying to accomplish, even if the technical detail that follows is very specialized. The objective frames your story. Separate out objectives from surrounding text. Use short declarative sentences or bullets to define your objective so it's immediately apparent to your viewer. Don't over-explain. As we said earlier, if your methods are standard and not a significant part of your story, don't go into detail. Clarify potentially con controversial details Use flowcharts, photos, or diagrams in lieu of text. 
but not photos of standard items like laptop computers. And returning to the audience of 98%, most of the audience will have a familiarity with standard sampling equipment and processes. You don't need to show them what your sampling device looks like if it's standard, not visually interesting. But if you are doing something visually interesting and you have some great photos, put these in your poster. Focus in on the data that are telling the story you set out to tell in the introduction. You do not need to show all your data points. Just show the trends, points, results to tell your story. By all means, you should be prepared to share your complete results with conference attendees who want more information. But for the sake of these few, you don't need to weigh down your poster with little tiny numbers and names of elements that can only be read by six inches away with reading glasses. Feel free to bring handouts. And again, we're not saying to leave out data that don't support your conclusions. Here, for instance, is too much information. Most of the space here is actually devoted to defining the species and common names, which was certainly not the author's intention of the table. And in fact, the author's intention is obscured because we really don't know what to make of this information. Nothing is highlighted or weighted. And remember that in a poster, even if you're comparing results in one table to information in another table, there might be four feet between your tables. In other words, your audience actually has to walk between tables. Your conclusion should stand out both visually and with your text. We recommend putting it in a box. Make it short, concise, memorable, and even quotable. Something on your poster is going to have to be placed so low on the frame that you need to bend down to read it. And unless your audience is super engaged and probably limber and short, they might not bother to stoop. So place the stuff that only the super engaged readers will want to read in this location. Back to the theme of this presentation. Using easy-to-understand language increases your audience, is more compelling, and more memorable. The passive voice obliterates the direct line to the author. Who did this research? Take credit using the first person, singular or plural. Some of your sentences might be passive, and not all of your sentences have to start with I or we but you will discover that it's easier to write and read this way. You don't tie yourself in knots trying to figure out who did what to whom. Double benefit to using short words. They're easier to read and they take less space. Short words are just as professional as long words. Short words such as use, not utilize. Start, not commence or initiate, wrong, not erroneous, also, not similarly. And the same goes for using these classic phrases used when a word will do. What we mean by using acronyms sparingly is that you should only use them if they're helpful to your audience. So favor words over acronyms. If a word is short, it's easier to read and remember than an acronym. Only define acronyms that come up more than once or twice. Otherwise, just spell out the whole word every time you use it. And try to avoid a whole string of acronyms within a sentence. And lastly, don't define acronyms that are more common than the words they define, i.e. GPS, JPEG, DNA, GIS. You can just leave those alone. Some construction tips. Break up your text with subheads. Especially given the size of the posters, a subhead allows your reader to find and keep his or her place in your material. It also helps you to organize and sort your text. 
Number two, decide how you're telling your story. Is it a process of discovery, a honing in from general to specific, or are you going to take your readers through time? And in number three, remember that you have limited space and your audience has a limited attention span. Save the minor details for your one-on-one -on -one discussions or for handouts. Your presentation should not ask people to hire you or buy your product. Talk about what you did, but remember that CTAC is a professional organization that espouses a broad range of points of view. The conference is meant to provoke debate, but not attacks. And now on to the design portion of the presentation, beginning with layout. So how do we place all of that content onto our poster? First, it is important to remember your poster needs to be readable from five feet away. And remember that people will have to walk from one end of the poster to the other to take in the whole thing. You need to construct a flow that works and put the memorable eye-catching images at eye level to reel in your audience. So how do you do this? Starting with a blank canvas can seem overwhelming. Where do you start? One tip is to break your space up into units where you can section information into logical groups. Dissect your draft poster into a grid. This can become the basic blueprint of your future poster. Play around with moving text and sections to fit in different parts of your grid. Make smaller sketches and mock-ups to help plan and come up with the best solution. Lots of text at a distance. Huge, chunk, huge chunks of text that go on forever are visually overwhelming and intimidating to readers. It is hard to find your place when you're reading. How would you find your place in this? Break it up. Create easy to digest sections. You can do this in different ways. Splitting text box up with columns, adding a buffer of white space, and break up your text with visuals. A common mistake that people make is trying to cram in too much onto the poster. Don't butt things right out to one another. Let it breathe. CTAC suggests using only 50% of the actual poster area for content to maintain this balance. Having a good layout is key to helping viewers quickly visually process your poster and keep them interested. Catch their eye from far away and reel them in with large legible fonts, white space that gives your poster breathing room, and interesting images. Design principles. Design principles go hand in hand with the layout of your poster. These are some simple basics on how to practice good design as a non-designer. First, a little background on the two main types of fonts, sans serif and serif. Sans serif fonts are fonts without the horizontal elements at the bottom of the letters, like Arial, Calibri, Helvetica. They form more distinct words and are better for headlines and large, bold text. Serif fonts have extra stuff at the tips. Serif fonts are generally used for large swatches of body text in posters or papers. The most common serif font is Times New Roman. Don't be afraid to use two types of fonts on your poster, sans serif for headers and titles and serif fonts for your body text. On your poster, the bigger the better for text size. These are loose guidelines, but don't use anything smaller than 18-point font for text, and if you really need to, 16-point font for tables. Using larger font size makes it easier on your audience. They do not have to crowd way in to read your content, but can instead stand from afar and take more of your poster in while reading. Remember, people should be able to read from five feet away. A common mistake is not spacing text effectively. Here is a list of things you might present that runs all together as it is. Make it easier to digest by grouping like things and emphasizing key points. 
Physical closeness implies relationship. An emphasis calls attention to important points. Do not be afraid to make certain texts big and bold. Here's an example of an issue that is seen frequently in scientific posters. Sections are placed on the poster without aligning them or having spatial relationships with other objects on the page. Remember your initial grid. Let it help you keep things aligned. See how aligning everything makes it look better and easier to follow? Using color. Color is a powerful design tool. Color can add interest to your poster and highlight things that you want to be noticed. But when using color, it is important to make sure it is harmonious. Don't be tempted to use black as a background color for your poster, and especially no neon colors on black. This is a very jarring color scheme and is actually a very common mistake. People might associate these colors as immature or unprofessional. Brighter does not mean better or easier to read. Sometimes subtlety can be better. Pick a simple, pleasing palette and stick with it through your poster for text and design elements. Pick three to five highlight colors. Don't be tempted to make everything a different, different color. It will seem uncoordinated and confused if you color everything differently without purpose. Also, remember the colorblind. Don't use red on green. This is the most common type of color blindness, and 7 to 10% of all males are colorblind. So it's important to keep in mind. Color coding can help orient viewers and create a common theme throughout your poster. Here is a great example of this. Different reaches of a river were assigned a different color, so throughout, one would know what reach was being discussed by the color of the associated header. And another great example of how color can come to represent and code different topics throughout your poster. Contrast is another important design principle that can help make your poster pop visually. Here you can see how using big, bold, high contrast title bar is much more exciting than using plain text as your title. The combination of large white text on the solid blue bar creates much more visual interest. So, important design principles to keep in mind when you're designing your poster. Font. Choose appropriate and good size fonts. Use grouping emphasis and alignment to help your posters seem coordinated and flow well. And use colors and contrast to help add interest. But be careful not to go overboard. And it is always a great help to have colleagues or friends look over your design in the, gra in the draft stage of your poster and give you feedback. Graphics. This section will discuss the best way to use graphics in your poster. Instead of cramming every bit of information you have into a table, is it possible to represent your findings visually? Replace tables when you can with a chart or graph, or pull out a single row of your table to make your point. You have limited room, and make sure you are getting to your story with what you are presenting on your poster. Don't provide all the details and overload the viewer. Focus on the pertinent facts. Isolate the data points you want to bring attention to. And CTAC suggests organizing tables and figures chronologically in a vertical progression. You can evil label right on the graph the story that you want to tell. Keep in mind when creating graphs in Excel or other software to keep the text on your figures legible. There is no point in including labels that cannot be read. If you're studying something interesting, include a picture. Intriguing visuals will pull in viewers. Just make sure your photos, your photos are high enough quality to be printed. Do not include blurry photos on your poster. 
Include credits on photographs taken by someone other than the authors. Don't use photos or any other materials without express permission. And don't just pull down images from the internet. They most often have some sort of copyright protection, even if it does not say. Using pictures as backgrounds. As a general rule of thumb, do not attempt unless your image is very subtle, low contrast, and unintrusive. The image should not obscure your text. You don't want to make it a challenge for people to read your writing because of a design choice. And avoid cliché when using images. Using word art, comic sans font, and clip art can detract from the professionalism of your poster. Make sure your graphics have meaning and are not decorative fluff. CTAC guidance is specific on this subject. Logos and advertising materials should not be used. If you're feeling very adventurous and creative, you can add features to your poster to really catch people's attention. Embedded iPads have been used before in posters at CTAC to great, great success. They can be used to loop animations or photos to demonstrate change over time and add a real wow factor to your poster. QR codes can link your poster to additional web-based information if you are familiar with how to use them. And we suggest attaching an envelope for business cards. So when using graphics, make sure they are easy to understand, interesting, relevant, and high quality. Good graphics can make for a great poster. You have a lot of choices to make. Text, layout and design, graphics and infographics all in support of your story. And we close the design section the way we opened, by reminding you to keep it simple. And we suggested early on we are finishing up by reminding you of the story we just told, which is less narrative, less data, less words. And now let's discuss getting there, logistics. It all comes down to showing up with your poster. Printing and transportation. Print your poster out at full size or close to it and look it over closely. Offer someone lunch if they can find the typo, because almost inevitably there is one to be found. When you choose your printing method, a high gloss laminate can be distracting, but a semi-gloss laminate can help make your poster look more finished. Leave yourself a week to 10 days to get your poster printed and shipped, or get it printed at the conference, but remember that the printers near the conference might get booked up and need more time. Posters that fit the boards look much better at the conference, and they have the advantage of having provided you more space to work with. CTAC specifies eight feet by four feet, but that's the outside measurement to the frames. If you can use a printer with a custom paper size, seven and a quarter feet, that is 87 inches, by three and a half feet, that is 42 inches, would be ideal. Or get the next largest size your printer can manage at roughly those proportions. You can see from this slide that the posters that are proportional look an awful lot better. Get to the poster area on time to set your poster up so that it's available for viewing as soon as the poster area opens. In our experience, double stick Velcro is a much neater way to pin up your poster than thumbtacks, but either are approved. And bring either or both with you. They will not be provided for you. And in case you did not find your typos, some whiteout and a marker can help with subtle changes. We mentioned an envelope earlier, and if you don't have one affixed to your poster, still be sure to bring one to tuck or thumb take into, into the poster frame so that people can leave you their cards or notes. And don't forget business cards. Get there early and rehearse what you'll say. Ask yourself the toughest questions, then answer them, and then answer them again until you get them down. Speak with enthusiasm and be at your poster during breaks or in poster social. For more on writing, this is a very helpful short book on science writing with clear, easy-to-follow rules. These three sites 
offer some great tips on preparing and presenting posters. Thank you for listening to us today. See you at the conference. This is the end of our presentation, although we have two slides of references to follow.